Okay. So I gave somebody a list of things to remind me to talk about because we're talking about agents, but there's more to do. So who wrote that down and um, can give it back to me so I can write it up here and we can kind of have our itinerary for the day? How, how to find an agent and an editor. Was yes, what you wrote. okay. Agents, finding them. Um, I think we were going to talk about uh, publishing platforms. I believe I mentioned that. Is there anything else I put on that list? Film deals. Film deals, yes, you're right. All right, film. Okay. Uh, this is a pretty meaty uh, group of topics for us to get into. Uh, let's launch into it with agents, all right? Um, agents. Agents have, because of, um, they, they have a somewhat um, sketchy reputation among some people. Um, this is mostly caused by uh, a lot of the, um, the agents in music and film, where the agents tend to get a, a certain reputation. In books, um, agents generally have a better reputation. Um, most authors I know are at least moderately pleased with their agents. Uh, agents do have a reputation, um, a fairly good reputation. When I was first breaking in, there was you know, no talk of agents being even really very bad. It was all very positive about agents. In the last 10 years or so, there's become a larger, there's a greater sentiment of resentment towards some agents as certain things happen more and more in the industry as the shift to ebooks has impacted the industry. So I'll talk about some of those things. Um, but first, I'm going to kind of approach it from the classical aspect of why would you want an agent? What does an agent do? Who is an agent? Um, so, what they do. So, your agent is going to be your publishing partner. Um, usually, you will sign with an agent under a simple contract. Um, let me invite this over here, agent contract. An agent contract, the one I signed with my agent, simply said, I, I agree to let the agent represent my work, um, and I will give them 15% of any deal negotiated. Um, and the other, only other thing it said is, either one of us can, um, can end this arrangement uh, with, a, with 30 days notice. Um, so, ending. There's some things to understand about this. In my agreement to work with my agent, I basically agreed to let them handle um, all of my books. It's not that straightforward, however. I know a lot of people who will um, say to the agent, I want you to handle this series only, or I want you to handle my adult books, and I'll find someone else for my children's books, um, or you know, things like that. Um, our agreement um, was, was just basically a handshake. You represent my books. Um, I, I do my own short fiction. He's not, it wasn't interested in the short fiction. And, um, and there we go. And if there was a rise to book that I didn't want to the agent, we'd just talk about it. And it probably wouldn't be an issue if I wanted to do that some other way. <coughs> <coughs> this could be more and more something you want to consider in an agenting agreement. Um, what you want to agree to let them represent, <coughs> I think these contracts vary very widely depending um, on the agency. So just keep that in mind. Uh, in the old days, there actually wasn't even a contract usually. It was just a handshake. Um, the other thing about it is um, even if you end the contract with the agent, the agent will continue to receive the money from any deals he or she negotiated. Okay? So let's say they sell your first book and then you don't like this agent, you um, part ways, and you go and you sell your second book to sell, uh, with a different agent. The first agent will continue to control this contract as long as that contract is in force and will continue to get 15% off of it, okay? Mm -hmm. That's something to keep in mind. Um, another thing that, to keep in mind is that usually the money goes to the agent who takes 15% and then sends it to you. Um, there are people online who suggest that they don't like this arrangement at all and would require any agent contract to say 
that the publisher splits out the 15% and sends it to the agent and sends the rest to you. This is the, um, the more, um, how shall I say, paranoid way of looking at it, though paranoid, paranoia can be healthy. This can be a healthy paranoia. That means that you don't have to wait on your money. That also means that you don't have to account um, your agent nearly as much, keeping track of what they're sending you and what's being negotiated, which you all, always should be doing. Go ahead. In the big picture, I mean, math-wise, does it really make much of a difference? No, it'll be the same. Um, if your agent is honest, it'll be exactly the same. In fact, it'll be easier for you, though you'll get you the money a little bit it. slower because the agent will tax-wise give you a 1099. Um, instead of each publisher giving you a 1099. So if you have multiple publishers and things like this, all of the money flows to the agent, and then the agent gives you one 1099. So for tax purposes, that one can make it a lot easier. You will get your money more slowly. Um, our agent contract, actually, I forgot it had in here a how long he was allowed to sit on the money. It was basically, if a check comes in for more than this amount, I'm required to give you an overnight check um, worth this or something like that. Um, Joshua's always been very, very good at this. Usually it's the next day, and it's now done just a, a bank transfer. We just get nice. the money um, stuck right into the bank account. So there's a one-day delay. Um, and the other, the other thing about it is the yeah. So, but there are people online who say they would never sign a contract that goes this way, and I can completely understand. Um, and you just have then the publisher split it off. Uh, this really only becomes a big issue if, one, the agent is um, untrustworthy, which doesn't happen with a lot of the big agencies, or, which could happen, you split ways with them, and suddenly the money that you're getting has to go to somebody that you broke paths with, and they're suddenly not as, you know, it's not like they're going to be criminal and ha keep your money, but your check getting to you is going to be on the bottom of the list. Um, and you get their like secretary that. on the phone more than you get them. <laughs> So that's something to keep in mind. So those are, those are the things that are going to be an agency agreement. And in exchange for that, what an agent is going to do is they're going to be a contract expert. Um, they are going to be an expert on the publishing houses. Um, they will also be an expert on the current state of the genre. That said genre. That means that what is selling, they will know. They will know who is buying it. They will know what sort of clauses are happening in contracts um, with other people, um, and that sort of thing. They will have a reputation. When a new author gets, um, is publishing a book and they send it to an editor, um, and that's on the desk, and a submission from Joshua, who represents me and Charlene Harris. Um, she does the True Blood books. Um, meaning uh, an agent who has huge numbers of bestsellers and um, dominates the science fiction fantasy bestseller list, which one's going to get read first? The agents. So, a reputation, uh, meaning that they are, um, they are a gatekeeper. So having a good agent reputation can mean a whole lot. Um, in kind of side things, they can uh, hold book auctions. Um, they often are good editorially. And, you know, you have somebody kind of in your corner. They will argue for you, so you don't have to. That's actually a big one to a lot of writers. We do not tend to be um, negotiators, naturally. We don't tend to have had a lot of business classes. Anyone here in the MBA program? I know there's a few of you that were, yeah. So you might, um, but a lot of us are not necessarily good arguers. This doesn't even just come down to expert uh, in the contracts. It comes down to if you hate your cover, and you want to get the cover changed. Having an agent who can call and say, we think this cover is awful and you should feel bad, is different from you having to call your editor and say that, meaning you have someone to play bad cop, um, which would be really nice. OK? Um, for this expertise, they take 15%. 15% um, is not a, not a whole lot when you're new. 
When you're me, it's a ton of money. Um, but that's the way this works. They take chances on new writers and in exchange, hopefully grow those writers to the point that they are very successful, to the point that one author is making them enough money to make up for all the ones that are not making much. Scott and then here. Um, like when you're successful, and like you kind of been settled on publishing house and like right. what you're doing, it seems like they're offering less and less, so. Yes. They aren't offering less and less, um, but if you're never gonna change publishers, I guess they are. There are still important things with the arguing and playing back up. Um, editorially, um, if you're going to, like, I broke into, I, um, I, you know, did a YA book this last year. I let my agent hold the auction um, for, the, for Steelheart um, and things like that, which I would not have wanted to do myself. Um, so all these things still apply, but they do apply in a lesser extent. And instead of paying them, you know, um, $2,000 a year for all of this, you're suddenly paying them three hundred grand, um, And so that suddenly becomes... A, uh, a bigger deal. Now, the kind of understanding that you have is, um, like if I were to leave my agent right now, um, that would be a pretty big jerk move. Um, because, you know, um, that this whole idea that I'll get with you when you're, you're new and I'll help you out, and then I still think he earns his money. Um, he is very sure to pay a lot of attention to me now. <laughs> um, he always paid good attention to me. Joshua has the, one of the reputations as perhaps the very best agent in the business, if not the very best, then one of the best. Um, simply because he, even when you're nobody, he was making sure to contact you at least once a month, calling and chatting with you about what you're working on and things like that. He, he doesn't ignore authors. Um, but, yeah, now, um, now he pays a lot of attention. Um, so, but, you know, um, uh, yeah. Uh, but all of this stuff is still important. I find it worth the money. Now, if you don't, which is completely valid, there are options for you, okay, to keep in mind. Um, one of your options is entertainment lawyer. Okay? An entertainment lawyer theoretically can do most of this stuff, but you pay them hourly instead of a percent. That means you have to pay up front, um, but once the contract is done, they are done. There is the argument, so they're paid hourly. There are arguments to be had to say that, in general, they will be pretty good on this one, um, and they will be pretty good on this one, but they don't generally tend to do as well on any of the other stuff, meaning they're not going to sell your book for you. If you can, you'll have to sell your, you know, get a publisher interested and have them negotiate. Does that make sense? Um, they are not necessarily going to be an expert in your specific genre. They'll be an expert in contracts. Uh, or, you know, they may not know the publishing houses as well. For instance, you know, the agents are regularly doing lunch with all of the, um, the editors in their field. This is one of the things they do. Um, but um, if the idea of I might lose this. They're certainly not going to be doing editorial work for you. If I, I'm willing to lose this, um, they might do the book auctions. But in order to pay them hourly and then be done, and hopefully in the back end have a lot, this could make a lot of sense. A lot of sort of mid-list writers that I know that part ways with their agent amicably, but just are just like, you're not doing enough for me. I feel that, you know, and they're just like, all right, they will go with one of these because they already have their own reputation and their understanding of the genre themselves. And then they all hire. Like, like, I think Dean Wesley Smith is very big on entertainment lawyers. Um, and a lot of the, the self-publishing crowd is also very big on entertainment lawyers. Is, is there any convention uh, against renegotiating with your agent? With your agent? Um, I have not heard of it being done, but I'm sure it can be. Anything's negotiable. Uh, but, yeah. 10% um, used to be the standard, and it moved up to 15% in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, so, so this is, so that's one of your options. The other one is to do it yourself, um, which is hard, but doable, particularly if you have a background in contracts and in negotiation yourself. If you have a legal background and you can read these contracts and really know what they mean, um, Lee Modisit, um, Ellie uh, Modisit Jr., 
you may have heard of him. He's a fantasy novelist and science fiction novelist, lives in southern Utah. Um, he was uh, worked in D.C. for a long time. I think he was a lobbyist and an attorney and things like that. He does all of his own contracts. Um, hasn't had an agent for anything except for foreign rights, which I should mention the foreign up here. We talked about that, uh, translation rights. They can sell to, um, to other countries and things like that. Yes? Do you come to an agent later and just say, I need foreign rights then, can we have a contract just for that? Yes, you can. You know, I would go to Lee and ask him how he did it, um, but I also see rumblings of self-published authors doing this, getting an agent only for foreign sales. Okay, so, um, so I find this very useful, um, and my agent has always treated me very well.